All right. Uh, my name is Amal Abid. Um, I'm Tunisian. I grew up and lived there um, and came to Barn for my undergrad. My a degree in computer science and philosophy here, which I can go for hours explaining why. Um, and uh, now I am uh, co-leading Thinkit, which is a, a, a social-driven or mission-driven company that is connecting tech talent in North Africa with uh, top-tier engineering jobs uh, remotely all over the world. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Pooja. I graduated from Barnard in 2001 which I don't like to talk about because it was a very long time ago. Um, but uh, yeah, so I uh, co-founded a startup in 2011 uh, that I then sold in 2016, and it was called Rankin Style. Um, and it, basically, the mission was to simplify how women shop online through data-driven top 10 lists. So we would pull in data from a variety of different sources, user reviews, bestseller lists, what was trending and buzzing across um, the internet, and pull it all in and then come up with these 10 top 10 lists in single product categories like best leggings, um, best bras, things like that. Um, so uh, I sold that and now I work for another company um, and I'm still very data focused. Um, so I do product development um, for a market research company um, and build tools for our users or our researchers, um, working with tons of data um, all the time and kind of learning new things in that space. Hi, my name is Christina Hawatma. I'm the founder and CEO of Scopio, an AI-based search engine um, to find and get permissions for people's images on social media. So think of it like a Google for Instagram meets Pinterest. There's a link uh, online on the, the site. You should check out the website. I went to SIPA where I thought I would go and uh, study politics and become a political leader, save the world. And that's when I fell in love with technology and um, started my company here. Um, I started working on it in 2012-13. Hi everyone, I'm Sonali Negam. I am a early stage founder of a pet wellness company called Mittens, based out of the Columbia Startup Lab. I'm an engineer by training, and I worked um, in multiple different roles across the healthcare industry before um, taking the leap into entrepreneurship. And uh, happy to be here today. Okay, great, thank you. So these are basically the three questions that I always want to know anytime I meet anybody. Um, I'm just gonna tell you what they are and then we'll start and I'll call on you guys at random or just jump in. So the things I always wanna know um, now and also when I was younger is how do you get, how did, like your origin story, how did you get the idea for what you're doing and then how did you position yourself? This is a two part question. How did you position yourself to do what you're doing now? So it's for all of you who are like, how do I get to be up here doing this? How did you do that? So I'm gonna start down at the end with Sonali. Sure, so like I said, I worked in healthcare my entire career and uh, I think engineers by nature, we want to be problem solvers. So um, I'm also a lifelong pet owner and animal lover. And uh, I noticed over time that my experiences with pet care were not exactly what I wanted them to be. Um, in particular around insurance and uh, that really led to the birth of the company. Um, I wanted to find a way to educate people on how to take better care of their pets and also protect themselves financially by purchasing insurance. So it was a personal pain point, essentially. So I like this because this is how we teach all of our teams that are going through our program to approach a problem is you, you identify an unmet need. Like for us, it's what is the unmet clinical need, but this is what is the need? You had a pain point? And you said, I'm gonna try to fix that. So just as you're out in the world, you know, you see a, an issue, a problem, and then think creatively. It's all about innovation. So, um, do you wanna go next? Yeah, I always feel like that's such a hard question because it makes it seem like it's a linear line sure. to start a company, <laughs> yeah. and sometimes you don't even know why you're jumping into something and then obsess about it for a decade, two decades, I don't know, whatever it may be. Um, but I, in my case, there was, I felt, this huge shift in the world that happened, which was the explosion of people posting imagery and communicating their stories, and it was an opportunity to like change kind of the world, I felt. And so at that point, there was, um, you know, like, uh, th at that time it was called, called the Arab Spring. I know that it influenced a lot of people, and just the images were so remarkable, and I, and so I was like, why do I want to be in politics when this is the biggest change that maybe will happen in my lifetime? How can I participate in this? And so the problem that I had figured out was a technology, a technological problem. It was how do you organize this content? How do you make it accessible? 
and um, you know what is involved, and it ended up being a really complicated, difficult uh, path through technology in order to curate and filter and find the results that you're looking for, especially when people are posting so many different ways. So I think it was acknowledging that there was a really big shift happening, wanting to be a part of it, and then also mixed with the fact that I've you know, always wanted to do something very big. I've always wanted to make a big change. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure a lot of people here, you get into Barnard because you're like doing leadership mm -hmm. when you're 14, you know, and you want, want to do that. So I felt like technology, and it still is if you're considering it, to be in technology now is like the most fascinating thing. Mm -hmm. And there's so much happening. It's so hard, but it's like the most challenging path mm -hmm. that like I could have seen that I wanted to learn about. Okay. So we'll keep going down the line. Yeah, sure. So um, I think my um, company, Rank, I'll talk more about Rank as well, was just, um, again, like a personal problem. So, and it's also something that kind of came across um, in conversation with friends. So we were all just sitting at a table, and one of my business partners was, who then was just a friend, was talking about how she was going to Thailand, and she was looking for um, sunscreen that was, um, you know, not like going to be super damaging and she wanted something like more natural and she did a search for it and it produced like a million results and she was like why isn't there something that just tells me what to buy um, and then you know we started talking about it and also personally realized that I actually hate shopping so I hate going into stores I really feel fatigued when I online shop because there's so much stuff um, it's just like how do you sort through it um, so we were just really figured out that there was like some way to kind of simplify this process for women and also that another aspect of that was that a lot of magazines and everything, you know, you don't know, do you trust these editors because they're getting paid to talk about these products, like what is a way to kind of make this an objective space for women to easily shop online and that's kind of how the problem started and um, we figured out that we wanted to kind of go down the path of figuring out if it was possible and you know, th thought about the technology aspect and talked to a, a couple of people to figure out what was possible and were ultimately able to kind of deliver that. Um, and then my personal background is more in, again, like graphic design was um, is also like engineering, very problem solving focus. So whether or not you're, you know, designing something kind of fitted in a specific space or kind of trying to build something totally from scratch and you have nothing and no sense or no ideas how to build an algorithm, it's still kind of the same um, mental process and thinking of like how do you take a problem, how do you solve it, and like what are the ways to kind of get there. Um, my story is a bit more related to Christina's when she talked about the Arab Spring. So I grew up in Tunisia, which um, is a really tiny country on the tip, tip of the, uh, on the Mediterranean. It's very beautiful beaches. Um, and um, when I was there, um, I was in high school when the Arab Spring started. Um, it was, I, I used to go to hi the high school in uh, Tunis, the capital, and so for me to go back home, I had to cross through the main big avenue where the protests used to happen, and to me that was a very um, interesting moment of my life where it showed me so much of what I really cared about, um, seeing people really going up to the streets, putting their lives in danger just to fight for things they really believed in. Um, it was really powerful to watch it firsthand, and I couldn't just go back to not having lived that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so moving out, out from Tunisia to come to the States and coming to Barn as an undergrad, uh, I came on in 2013, so only two years after, um, and I, would, I was always in the state of comparing the opportunity that I used to see in there and the opportunity that I'm seeing in here. And uh, it was very clear to me that people in there are very, very skilled and talented, and that all they need is access to opportunity. And I was in a very privileged situation where I had access to both. And so my, my, my background was, um, or what I did in here was mostly computer science and philosophy because I was fascina fascinated by the, the logic, um, but also the practicality of building things with computer science. Um, and um, putting the two together into one single product that is empowering people and allowing them to build their own things. And in the long term, the way I look at it is more of uh, disrupting people's lives. Because really what we're doing, we're really giving people a space to tap into what, you, what used to be inaccessible to them. And no matter how much you have in mind of what you can achieve with that, there's always bigger potential that you might, might have thought of. It's just a matter of giving, giving skilled people resources and let them grow within them. And this is really what, what really pass, passions me the most about uh, bringing these two things together. Great. So since we're on a mall, I will ask the next question, which is, what's your biggest challenge now every day? So you guys brought us up to where you are. Like now on a day-to-day -day basis, 
what do you struggle with? Like, what, what's it like, the hardest thing? Obviously, there's a lot of rewards and things that hopefully you like. <laughs> but what are you, what's your biggest challenge? Well, first of all, I have two jobs right now, which is not working. <laughs> You have um, two jobs. Oh yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm working with Amazon right now, a software engineer, which is also like involves a lot of my time. Um, so that the time issue aside, um, other than that, the bigger challenges I see are always mostly um, not only identifying the specific set of. So the way we, we identified people in Tunisia is really we found them a pattern of clusters. So basically, if we tap into some clusters. Um, we can then uncover other clusters. Mm -hmm. And I think this is why we're growing this, the, the challenge of growing this beyond ourselves and beyond our um, immediate communities comes to um, the problems of figuring out where do those clusters line up and how do we actually un uncover them. Mm -hmm. um, and this is mostly a skills, a skills um, kind of, uh, because it's the identification way of looking at it, so we're looking, at, looking for very skilled people um, that we know are available, it's just a matter of figuring out where to go and find them. Um, and other than that, the other challenge is obviously uh, building up more of um, wider um, partnerships that a lot of the issues that we face are um, uh, coming from a perspective that North Africa as a region doesn't necessarily have the best tech talent. Mm -hmm. So what we also end up doing a lot is really advocating for the region as a whole, really building up a whole, um, this is what you can actually find here, it's not just what you hear on the media. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a lot of talent coming up in there, so. Okay, great. What's your biggest challenge? So, yeah, I think I will talk about my challenge currently in my role, which is, you know, shifting from a startup to working again now for another company. Um, it's that I work with so much data and from different parts of the, like, the world and different areas, um, and all of it has a lot of differences, changes, things that are wrong every day, and like working with that data to try to understand it. And I also work with a very large team of engineers and data scientists who like a lot of times when they're talking, I have no idea what they're saying. And so <laughs> part of my challenge, which I love, I think it's like, it's, it's, it's working with people that are constantly teaching you something every day, which is great, but it's also extremely challenging from like some days my brain just really hurts from trying to understand like what we're trying to accomplish and from a specific thing that we're working on. Um, so I think there's, you know, it's like positive and negative. Um, but I think also just from a startup point of view, um, our challenge from that was um, just the technology cha challenge of actually building and scaling fast enough was something that we struggled with. It was just like we were, we were in the space for women's fashion and beauty, but we wanted to do maternity, we wanted to do baby, we wanted to do men's, but we were a team of five. Um, we had one CTO and one data scientist and we were just like, how do we scale quick enough, um, how, like what's the right amount to raise in order to kind of scale and move faster. Um, and that was something that was just constantly um, on our minds every single day. Okay. I think um, automation from day one, like when you're starting something, it's so like you just want to keep working through it. But there's literally when you start building a company, there's an automated way to do everything. Mm -hmm. um, so for, in our case, it was uh, price subscription plans on our website. Now you can go, you can pay $30 a month, and you can all you can eat search images and download images. For a long time, we were selling to businesses that we would do a call, you know, do a demo, we'd talk back and forth, we'd send a proposal, and in that process, you lose a lot of people. And, but we were like, it's gonna be like thousands of dollars, we're not gonna figure out how to do it, like we can't do it in-house. And everyone was just basically like, it's gonna be too hard. And then new tools are evolving every day. So we found a way to do it through Shopify. Um, and my um, co-founder is a d designer and she does front end, so she was able to put it together. And so in a fraction of a cost, we were able to start you know, um, commerce. And now we have people every day <coughs> signing up and buying that I've never heard of in my life. Um, and so that is remarkable. And that's the same with emails, following up on emails. Um, the hardest problem for me now, or for us, is the automation and having people hear about Scopio. So, you know, that's marketing, ads, there's a lot of money that's involved in getting more people to hear about you. And for, you know, for a startup, those costs can just blow you through the roof. So you have to find automated hacks, basically, to get through to yeah. different ways for everything. And you should spend time at any point and analyze what you can automate. And it is so much harder than, um, 
then it like seems like because you have to go out it's like a quest every day you know yes. you're a hunter trying to find you have to be lean like, and efficient right like, it's all about like what can you right do and then you're like here's a ten dollar plan to a thing that's going to solve three hours of my day yeah. and uh that you spent you know months doing yeah. so that's where time money especially for um, like when you're bootstrapping mm -hmm. and you don't have millions of dollars right. to go through, how are you going to use that capital efficiently yep. so that you can give more of your time? And that's more important than hiring a bunch of people because yep. your time and your brain is worth, you know, yep. so much more. So great. Okay. So Nolly. Yeah. So I'll kind of piggyback on that one. Um, you know, you mentioned working lean and efficiently. I'm, I'm solo, I have a small team, but essentially I'm the leader of the company. And for me, resource allocation of both my, my brain power and then my actual resources in terms of the assets of the company, which are very minimal <laughs> currently, um, that tends to be the biggest challenge. And I think regarding the pace of managing my own brain power and making sure that I'm effective and on point, um, there is a degree of self-care. So yes, pour yourself into building this, but also thinking about what are the things that help me stay grounded, stay centered, um, whether it's finding communities or meditating or whatever that may be, a favorite hobby. Um, on the other end, with the resources for the company, I've had to build a network of people, um, advisors, because I'm working solo who can sort of um, directionally nudge me in the right way if I decide to take on too much. So that's a continuing challenge, however, and I think I've found some ways to manage it. Okay, great. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip to a big juicy question. Um, and the lead into this is STEM tends to be male dominated. I'm not sure if we, this is acknowledged, right? This is a thing. So leading up to the panel today, um, we had all chatted and I went and I looked to see some of the promising trends of where this is going. And it is absolutely promising. I mean, the fact that we're all here and we have this entire event dedicated to entrepreneurship and STEM in particular. And uh, for our program, we were really excited because this year, so it's, uh, it's biomedical tech, um, usually male-led projects. But this year, it was 50 or 60% female-led projects. We actually had out of the 18 that went through our, that were semi-finals, we had like five women's health projects just randomly. So I was like, this is great, it's so exciting, there's a lot of things happening. Um, and then little things remind me that it's not as far as it needs to be. Um, so what happened this week, this is just a fun little story, not fun, well, anyway. Uh, one of the teams that had been led by a female um, PhD student, she had pushed the, the project it was her baby, it was based on her dissertation. She had come every week for 12 weeks to this workshop that we run, uh, three hours every Tuesday afternoon. She basically did most of the work. She had a team of people, but she led it. She had two male um, partners on the project who didn't show up much. They just kind of helped advise from afar, which is okay, until it was two days before our big pitch day. So this Tuesday, a couple days ago, is a pitch day that we, um, invite investors and we have judges and they're in the running for half a million dollars. And so it's a big deal. So this female um, engineer was like, here I go, I'm gonna do a great job. And she'd gotten great feedback. She was ready to pitch her project. She passed one of her PIs in the hall and he says, oh, send me the slides. I think I'm, I'm gonna pitch it. I, I mean, I'm gonna do it. I can do a better job. And she said, what the, right? And this is, like, it's not okay. She had done, she, there was no reason for her not to do it. Now, I say innovation is a team sport, and the person who pitches it should be the one who can get the funding. It sh doesn't matter if they're male or female. If the male happens to be the better person at presenting, I say let them present it. If the female is, it's all about getting the funds, right? But she was the one who could get it. So, um, that is very disheartening to me that they would mansplain their way <laughs> into just taking over. And it was, uh, anyway, so in the end, she went, um, I'm sure she felt, a little upset, but she went and she said, you know what, I need to be the one to pitch this. And they said yes. And the outcome, I have to, I'm happy to report, she presented it. It was beautiful. Afterwards, the judges said it was the best presentation of the day out of all 10 projects, and it has a happy ending. So I'm gonna open it up to say, what is it like for you, and I'm gonna let you guys volunteer who wants to go first, working in, I think, what is a male-dominated field, and do you have challenges do you have things that happen, and how do you deal with those? 
did she get the half a million? I cannot say because we haven't announced the results. So but it, <laughs> I know that um, she probably wants to know also. Um, I cannot say, but I have a good feeling that it will go well for her. How about that? That's awesome. <laughs> Does anyone want to start? I mean, I can say that I feel like, I mean, that's a very awesome and positive story. And I think working on a team now of, um, you know, my team, my overall team is around 20 something people. Um, and it's four women and the rest are guys. Um, and so I think one thing that I have noticed positively um, is we're doing a lot of interviews all the time. And I'm happy that like a lot of the develop actual developers and engineers that we're interviewing are more, they're more women than I think there were a, you know, two years ago or three years ago. Um, a lot of them are coming out of boot camps um, or they're studying it in school. Um, and I think now that there are women on our team, we are like, you know, we are, the four of us are very actively like, let's hire more women. And I think that that's like one big thing. And my boss actually, who is a guy is um, also very pro supporting um, hiring more women. So I think like one big thing that I've noticed and one thing that I think is important is like working in an organization where um, people are active or excuse me, actively trying to hire more women in that in the space in order to like kind of change the balance. Um, I think you have to like at this point in time still actively think about it. It's not just something that's just like oh it's going to happen. Um, I think it, it's definitely different, but I think it's also something that you still have to be very conscious of. But I think if you are conscious of it, um, the talent is out there, and which makes me really excited. Um, and then. I think it's just about kind of continuing to cultivate um, and making, you know, the, the women that join our team that are in a more male dominated um, environment, how do we kind of make them feel supported and make them, you know, understand that they're like, you know, they're, there's, there's equal footing, um, we're giving them the same level of projects, like making sure that they feel comfortable and supported, I think is also really important. Um, I will say like working at Rank and Style, um, one of the biggest challenges that we face, which I have talked about before, is just when we were um, going out to get money. So I think also this has changed a lot as well, but when we were out raising money, um, we were trying to explain, you know, why this specific product was important. Like, why is it important that the woman, that a woman has like the perfect pair of legging, leggings or like the perfectly fit bra was really hard to explain to a room of like, you know, old white men. So I, I like, I think that was very challenging for us. Um, and every time we went out and we met a new investor, we were just like, they don't understand the problem. Um, and I think also that has, again, changed. The landscape has changed a little bit. There, are more investors, um, more female investors in these bigger VC companies, and they're also very, very like a lot more like women-focused um, investors, um, and that they're actively investing in female-led um, startups. So I think that is also changing, which is is um, exciting. But there's still, I think, a long way to go. Mm -hmm. I guess I go next on this one. Um, I'm comparing my experience at Amazon where I walk into meetings with 20 plus people where the, I'm the only software engineer and only woman. I mean, I'm the only software engineer woman, but also I'm the only woman in the whole room most of the time. And then I compare it to my team meetings at Thinkit where I think the exciting part about building a company is that you get a chance to, to, to build it or form it the way you want it to look like. And uh, I think though one thing that is really exciting about that is First, you can choose who you work with. So you can choose people who really believe in the same uh, uh, values that you believe in, as, as in making sure that it's a very equitable place for men and women. And this is something that we are very focused on, on at the Think It, and uh, my co-founder is right there uh, proving that. <laughs> um, so we, 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 the, way we, the way I believe it really works a lot for us is that we're very vocal about it. And I think part of having gone to Bonnard um, kind of puts you in that mindset like, yes, I know it's, it happens very, very often. And so we're going to set this up clear and uh, loud from, from the first day. Uh, we have a, a rule within our team where you, most engineers and most, most people, when they talk about things, they say, uh, the customer, he does this, or uh, the engineers, he does that. And in our team, we have a very strict rule for saying um, he or she, or they, or them. Or, uh, but at least you should start saying he or she, and then you know, make sure that you're being vocal about it. And it started as a little joke initially between me and my co-founder, and then it became more of like a whole big team culture thing. Um, and even we set up our team values, and within one of them is really about making sure that our place is really 
inclusive to people as well. Um, so I really believe it's a lot about us as women and also men who believe in the same cause, building a supportive, a supportive system around us mm -hmm. and not making it seem as if, if you bring these things up, you're bringing them as something that is um, out of place or please be a little more inclusive. It's more like you, should, you just have to be inclusive. It's not an option not to be. Um, and when, when the leadership sets that tone, the rest of the team follows as well. And even when you're hiring, like when we review applicants, when we get applications, we look how many women and how many men have, have we got? Why are we not getting enough women applicants? Then something that we're doing is wrong. Um, and um, yeah, I, I strongly believe it's a, it's a matter of you as a leader of a company or a leader of an organization being very vocal about it and loud, and loud about setting it, setting, setting that, that tone clear in the organization that other people follow. It's not that people are not, um, uh, they don't want more women on the team, it's that they have never been pushed to fully think about it and act on it. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, great, thank you. Um, look, I guess uh, as an entrepreneur, um, the most important thing I can talk about is understanding where access levels are and you have to map out where there are opportunities. So in the beginning, there's a lot, I mean, everyone's like talking about it, it's a buzzword, it's a topic, everyone wants to see, seem like they're being helpful. But in reality, as if you're starting a business, you wanna find people that have affinity to your company or to you, um, and then you are able to then map out opportunities. So, for example, um, my co-founder and I work out of The Wing in Soho, which is a really uh, popular co-working space, and it's only women. And so in the beginning, I was like, that's not fair. The future is fluid. You know, we have male employees that we work with. Um, but then you realize the network, you know, there's a 10,000 person wait list and they have directories within it and you know that capital is flowing that way and networking and people want to help and buy your products. So that you have to see like, okay, this is an established, you know, important point and as an entrepreneur you need to leverage different things. I went to Columbia, you know, you leverage Columbia. I'm lucky one of my investors is in the room uh, that works at Columbia, which is great. Um, so, so that's your first community, and then as you develop your, you know, um, company, there's different communities you need to latch onto in, or, in order to get to the next step. So I did 500 startups in California. That wasn't, you know, geared towards women, but it does have a diversity angle, and they do make an active effort to find different types of companies and different types of people. Um, and so, so you go there, but in the process, you need to be very careful because you need to know what is going to get you either capital or resources to keep filling the business and anything else can be distracting. And so in those narratives or in those experiences, you have to be very aware and know who's there to really help you or help drive the business forward and who wants to kind of not complain, but just keep the conversation that is not helping you advance. So I had a meeting. Um, at a really big company and I was doing a demo and like all the, the people were there and then all the bosses left, there was like the young designer who was a woman and she was like, I just wanna let you know that I can't believe this is your company and I'm so proud to meet you and good job and mm -hmm. stuff and at the end of the presentation and I was like, I really don't need you to pat me on my back, why don't you just buy a subscription, it's 250 bucks <laughs> to support me and help me build a big business, I wanna employ you know, hundreds of people if I can and create my own culture. Um, and to her, she was like kind of offended and shocked and, and then I realized she doesn't have the purchasing power so me saying that to her is actually not even gonna be able to drive the needle forward. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was really awkward and I was just kind of annoyed and I said it uh, but then I was like, you know, I think I'm going to say this more, you know, so you want to support me, you buy, a pro buy one of my products or mm -hmm. do something like that instead of just being like, good job, you know. So, <laughs> uh -huh. so that's where affinity networks and seizing opportunities, doing these pitch competitions, winning them, keep, mm -hmm. you know, keeping going mm -hmm. is very important um, and you have to do that pretty quickly. So. Okay, great. Finale. Yeah, so I feel that, you know, I'm really bullish on women in STEM and in entrepreneurship. I don't think there's ever been a better time if you want to build something or if you want to be in tech. Um, to your point, there's a lot of new communities that support women who want to do, do either or both. So leveraging those communities and, you know, not just like signing up, but actually showing up, participating, volunteering, um, helping out other members of those communities 
to me personally, has been really helpful. Um, I think I've built a lot of confidence knowing that I can support other women. So if there is a pitch contest, helping other women in my community sort of practice or giving them feedback. Um, I know women that have never worked in tech before but want to do a tech-enabled product. And I used to be a product manager in my last job, so just walking them through um, how to build a product roadmap. Just ways to grow yourself, but also to help other people who um, might be in the same boat, I think is um, what is helping the growth of women in tech and also women in entrepreneurship. So I would really seek those out for anyone that's looking to do either or and really try to leverage, you know, there is, there is that movement that's building right now. So um, join that and, you know, support that. Okay, great. So I would like to volunteer my own um, thoughts too because uh, the thing that has helped me a lot is finding mentors and advocates. So whether male or female, doesn't matter. But um, I know a lot of my mentors tend to be female females who are here and I'm still, you know, trying to get up to there or um, just people who have maneuvered the space and figured out ways to move around barriers or go right through them. Uh, but definitely having people who you can go to and say, hey, how, how did you deal with that? What did you do? Um, and then in terms of advocates, the reason that I really like that is I think, and I don't, I think maybe as women in general, but I know me in particular, I'm not a person who's going to come in and be like, I'm the best and I'm so smart and I know I can do this, even though inside I think I can and I know I can, I am not going to say that. But what has helped me a lot is having other people in the room who will say it for me, um, which I should be able to say it for myself, but then there's also this reflection that I don't want to come across as cocky or overconfident. So I know that my um, business partner, he, I, mean, we've had, I had this specific conversation with him, I said, we have to build each other up. And you in particular, he's a huge talker. And this is just because he is, he has a lot of great things to say. So we go in a room, I'll let him talk, and I come across being like quiet and meek, and it's not really because I don't have anything to say, it's because I want him to be heard. So I said, listen, you need to build me up as well, and you need to let me talk. And he's like, oh, of course, of course. And so now we've got this great thing going on where you know, he'll talk and he'll say, but you know, as Andrea always says, and he'll say something brilliant, I don't know if I actually say it or not, but he, may, he attributes it to me, and then it makes me look good, but it's someone else saying it. And so I get a little bit of this, I, oh, wow, I look great, he's saying it, everyone in the room thinks I'm great, and it works really well. So, um, so definitely mentorship, advocacy, um, and I think also just perseverance, and not letting little things throw you off. Um, another story about six months ago, maybe a year ago, when I uh, became CEO of this company, I went to pitch it to an investor, an angel investor here in the city. And he said, oh, you know, it's a good idea, but you really need to get some guy who's, uh, and he said guy, which I, I know it, maybe he meant gender neutral, but I took it. He said, you need to get some guy who's taken a product to market and done this in this space. Well, who do you think you are doing this? And I was very offended, and I was so angry, and I, I didn't say it to his face, but I said, well, thank you for your feedback. And I went home, and I cried, and then I was angry. And then I went back to him, and I said, tell me more about that. And actually, now he's a great advisor and friend of the, the company, and, um, may actually invest. So I, I didn't, even though I wanted to let it throw me off my game, I, I got through my emotional, like, oh, that's upsetting, and I went back. And what he said is, oh, I didn't mean that. I said, you just need someone who has done this before, so we're not paying you tuition to learn it. And I said, well, that means you're going to get an old white guy, because that's about who has, you know, rose up through a company and taken some, something like this to market. And he said, well, that's not what I meant. And I said, well, that's how it came. Anyway, we had a dialogue about it, and he was great, and he's now like a supporter of our company, so. Um, so do you guys have any questions? So I'll just, um, I'm coming from a engineering background. I have a master's in electrical engineering from Columbia. So I actually want to talk about very, something very practical. Um, and like I've always wanted to start a business, but what I've seen is that and especially in technology, it's like it, there's, it requires a lot of depth, a lot of understanding, a lot of ex experience, and then also just an implementation. And I've seen that some of the most, you know, high impact companies are founded by people with maybe doctoral degrees, 20 years of experience in uh, high performing companies like Intel, or just really, really strong backgrounds. And so 
I'm trying to, I, I guess I struggle to find that opportunity where, you know, we can enable technology or to, to its fullest, but you also have to have that like capacity to be able to lead and build a business in that sense. So uh, maybe you can touch on that point because, yeah, I just, I'm looking, that's, that's kind of what I'm looking to hear. I have a quick answer and then I'll, so my answer would be that innovation is a team sport and that nobody goes it alone, even though we love to hear these stories about you know, Steve Jobs, or like big names of one person, but he did not do that on his own. No one person does it on their own. So I would say like if one person lacks the depth, like I don't have a PhD, my, my partner does, and he is amazing and brilliant, but every one of us has something to give to that, um, that, that endeavor. So like find what you can give and find the people who can fill out what you don't have. So I know like he is a total dork. Like he could not sit up here and do this. He couldn't do what I do. And I know that and I can't do what he does, but we're a team. So it's complimentary and we're building our team. So that's my answer is to try to round out what you need um, to balance what is gonna be um, needed in, the, in whatever you go after. I don't know. Yep. I, I, I <laughs> sorry, it looked like you wanted to say something. Okay, so um, I think also another note, and this is something that I think people talk to me about all the time, is that you don't, even if you have an idea um, now or you don't, it's not like you, there, you don't have to like do it right now. Like there's not like, I think there's, a, there's both sides, right? Like there's the experience that you get from working at like a big company and like gaining those leadership like experiences which you can then bring to your company, or you could do it the flip and like you can learn a ton by starting your own company and then go work for another big company and learn more there. It's not like a set order and if you do one first and it's wrong or if you do the other one first it's wrong. I think there are many paths to success and I think there's many ways for you to, if, you, if your goal is to eventually start your own company, again, it's like you don't have to do it tomorrow, you're young, like you can do it at any point. Um, so I wouldn't feel, um, you know, I think if, if you feel that like there's a lot of skills and things that you want to gain, I think you learn a lot by starting your own company. Like a lot of things when I when I started my own company, I had no idea about like half the things that I learned, and I just kind of learned along the way. So I think there's a lot you can learn from either instance, and and you just like learn and grow, and then kind of apply that to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Christina, it's great that you're an engineer and have that background. Um, there's two things. First is that I said this before, but the website builders and the things that already exist out there will blow your mind when you start to see what products have already been existed that you can create a storefront or um, have a basis for your company. So if you have an idea, like tonight, go buy a website, put up a landing page, just make it more real in your head and you lose nothing from that. Um, the second thing, and then you'll start to discover as you get into those tools, that most of them are free. And then the second thing is there's an oasis at Columbia that are in Barnard that you guys like have under your <laughs> under your feet. You're paying a lot of money to be here. And um, and when I started, I was a politics student, and I basically was like, I want to learn machine learning and imagery, and and basically just um, there's a saying that's you are who you eat lunch with. Mm -hmm. So every time I was not in class, I was literally in a lab like having lunch with data scientists and sitting with them, and talking to them about my idea, learning what they were saying about it. And then I'd be like, how hard is this? They're like, oh, it's not hard, it'll take three years, blah, blah, blah. And then they start, so then I'd start to learn what was involved, who was needed, how long it will take. And that was like super awkward, I mean, if you think about it. And, and then um, I ended up, at, there was one lab that I found within Columbia and I was like, this is the lab for me, it's gonna like make my company. And, um, and so I literally just hung out there like every single day, it was so awkward, it was dark and like everyone was like coding the whole time. And I was like learning how to code by myself online, like not successfully, but the fact that I was doing it really gave me street credit and uh, it got me to like be able to kind of communicate and I have you know, no languages, I know that uh, like you need your field work in. And then eventually those relationships really matter. So now our system is baked with AI built from one of the like very high up like natural language processing guy, one a, a friend now that works at Columbia. And he was able to help me and 
probably if I had just hired him and didn't know him, I would have never in my life been able to afford um, that. But it took me like three, four years to actually know what I needed to do to automate this thing, the search engine, um, and then was able to use that relationship. And so all these pieces take a lot of um, you know time, but that immersion, that like going to lunch and learning and learning and learning, and being able to use that time now that you're a student, people like will do that. Um, you know, they'll, they'll be like, okay, you're a student, you want to learn, and you so you don't have that sh shame or guilt or feel like you're wasting people's time or you have to pay them for something, mm -hmm. um, and that like basically takes up all your free time too. <laughs> okay. So I don't know if that helped. Any other? One more question. If yes. Hi, uh, so my name is Thomas Dealey. I'm um, um, Director for Corporate Partnerships at School of Professional Studies. I am the investor that uh, Christina referred to. Um, and one of the, as one of the few guys in the room, maybe I'll ask a question, just advice, more advice for guys. Uh, so you mentioned you know, use of the term guys. Um, and I just want to do a shout out for an event which I'm doing this afternoon. Um, in February, at the School of Professional Studies, we launched a hackathon across, which we shared with 5,000 students and alums to measure gender diversity at executive level at early stage tech firms mm -hmm. and in academia. Um, and today at NASDAQ, we're having uh, the winning teams present to the Chief Diversity Officer, the Chief Human Resources Officer. So we're going to be asking an organization like NASDAQ, what can they do um, to, um, in this space? And in my view, it's a lot, given, given the position of NASDAQ with regard to technology firms. And I, I've been educating myself a little on the topic over the last um, uh, few months as the students have been going through this. Um, and I, I'll just make a couple of comments that I'm learning in, I don't want to take too long, but the World Economic Forum had a survey in 2017 where they estimated that gender parity will be achieved in 2234, so 217 years. Um, the, US, the US United States ranks 49 of 150 countries, and one of the reasons it's so low is on health and economic or, or political empowerment. So it was. And the US is in decline in, in that list. So while the US is high in education, so that these are uh, discoveries that I'm making. I've invo also invited to this afternoon's event, Haley So, who's uh, in Columbia College, who organized the first ever student-run hackathon on diversity div hacks, which was held here a couple of weeks ago, which was sponsored by IBM and two Sigma and all the others. But anyway, my, my question is um, advice for the, 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 the men. Advice for men. Advice for men. I mean, hire more women. I, mean, I think, I, I think like kind of what I said before, I think just like actively having, I mean, I don't know anything about you, but just in general, um, I think, you know, the actively hiring more women who will then hire more women um, to get more diversity. I think like there is just the need in, especially in like bigger companies that are more male dominated, um, an active effort to kind of get more women in the door, interview more women, um, bring more women in. As um, Amal said, like if you notice that you, a job description is only getting candidates that are men, what are you doing wrong? Like making just more note, like noticing it more and doing something actually about it. Um, and then creating an, a supportive environment to kind of help those women be good leaders in, in the company. Yeah, so um, I'm sure many of you have heard about blockchain, and most people in the room are probably familiar with the company IBM. The reason I bring this up is that blockchain is known for having a bro culture. So if you look at all the blockchain startups that are out there in the world right now, only about 16% of them involve women, which is staggeringly low, but it's what we've come to expect from tech. Um, IBM, on the, on the other hand, which is like, what, a 100-year-old company, and you know, we don't really think of them as that innovative, their entire blockchain leadership team comprises women, which I think is amazing, um, because I think they've made a very conscious effort 
to promote women into those roles and be supportive. And I spoke to someone uh, there a few years ago, um, a recruiter, and I remember thinking um, that they've created a culture of advocacy. So to your point earlier, your co-founder advocates for you. And the good managers I've had or the great male coworkers I've had, you know, if they see me at a table and someone's ignoring me or just talking over me, they'll say, hold on a minute. Sonali had something to say. And I think if men could do that more, um, you know, it's not just about hiring and bringing on the great women, it's also being supportive and empowering them to speak. Because a lot of times I would be the only woman at the table and I would start, start to shrink. You know, I'd get, try to raise my hand, nothing would happen, or um, I wasn't as loud as everyone else. It's, I was often also the youngest woman at the table. And I noticed that the male leaders who really, um, walked the talk, would take those little moments. They would pause and notice that um, there was a young female at the table who wasn't getting the opportunity, and uh, they would provide that opportunity to me or and to other colleagues. This is exactly what I was gonna say, is just listen to women, because we are probably, most of the time, not gonna be the loudest person in the room. We're not gonna walk in, I don't use, a, I'm not gonna use a crude enough, but like, we're not gonna walk in and be like, hey, okay, here we go, here's the answer. But we might very well be the smartest, the most creative, the most open to new things, the best at relationship building. There's all these other things just because we're not the loudest. So I think a lot of times our voices just don't get heard. And even there's this whole thing like lean in, speak up, but that's not always natural and it's not always the best way to go. So just listen. I think it's just, that's my, I didn't mean to yeah. interrupt, but that's exactly what I would have said too. To add to what you just said, sometimes it's put as in it's a, only the woman's responsibility to take action on those things. You just have to be confident, you have to speak up. But a lot of the times, as you explained yourself, like it just, it's also the responsibility of, of the men sitting on the table as well. You know, first start by being conscious yourself about what you say, the little, the little things, guys versus he, or like guys and he, or other small things that you say. But also as being speaking up and uh, stopping the conversation at the point and saying, yes, I think she has a point to make in here. Um, Okay, so I think we're out of time, but I, want, I just, wait, wait, I want to say thank you so much. You guys are amazing, and thank you for the great questions and for being here.